uh, temperature data and uh, temperature dew point data in the atmosphere using the NOAA uh, National Weather Service radio sounding archive uh, data. So radio sound data uh, is uh, data that's collected from weather balloons that are sent up through the atmosphere uh, with instrument packages that can measure things like uh, temperature, wind speed, um, and uh, saturation of water vapor pressure. So uh, that data is um, collected routinely at different sites across the United States uh, and at different time points. And we can access that data through the NOAA archive here um, by typing in the following web page or following the link uh, in the slides uh, or assignment uh, for the snow science class. So I've pulled up uh, today's observed sounding uh, archive. It's going gonna, it's gonna to uh, populate whatever the most recent data is. You can see that um, you're given these maps with dates and times. So today is the 6th of January and uh, I have some uh, time points for the 6th, but I also have location points that are marked by these blue stars. So I want to go uh, to, uh, if, I'm, if I'm using this data to evaluate most recent snowfall, I want to choose the dates or times most relevant to when the snowfall was actually occurring. Um, and I want to do that in a location nearest to the location where I'm evaluating that snowfall. So if we're in Colorado, of course, I'm not going to click any of uh, these that are uh, radio sound data taken from other parts of the country. Uh, if I'm looking at today, if I want to analyze precipitation that's currently happening or from the last 24 hours, I could click this uh, and that's going to pull up the map here and then I can click on uh, the location closest to where I will be. If I'm looking at Wolf Creek, then this is the Denver site. I'll click on this site and uh, that will generate this diagram, which is a composite of lots of different things, most of which uh, are beyond the scope of this class. Um, what we are going to look at is this diagram right here to the left, which is called the log P skew T diagram. There is a wealth of information here about what's happening in the atmosphere, um, most of which we're not going to leverage for this class, but uh, it's a fun deep dive if you want to look into how to interpret these things with greater detail. For us, uh, there's a variety of ways that we can think about the relationship between uh, the atmospheric temperature and the, the snow-liquid ratio or the snow-water equivalent, really what the moisture content of the snow is, which uh, we know is related to um, the habit or the shape of those crystals as they're falling uh, and the temperature and relative humidity. And so and instead of using the surface temperature as a proxy, uh, it's better to use the atmospheric temperature as a proxy because that's where the nucleation is really occurring and the crystal growth is occurring. And that can be radically different from the surface temperature. So to extract the, the temperature in the atmosphere, uh, one way to, to do this is to just simply look at what the temperature uh, is or was um, or the maximum temperature as the snowflake was falling through. And the, and the logic behind that is that um, if you use the highest temperature to evaluate what the moisture content could be, um, you essentially, that's when most of the crystal is being formed uh, because more water vapor is being added to the exterior of the crystal. And then as the, the flake falls closer to ground, if it gets colder, that's fine but uh, you have you've essentially frozen the crystal in place. Um, this isn't perfect by any means, uh, but it's one proxy and that's what we're gonna use in this class. No, this is sort of assuming that the flake is falling under um, no wind conditions because if there's significant horizontal component to the wind, then these uh, big dendritic crystals may actually uh, either rhyme uh, and add density that way or they may be abraded and broken apart, uh, and that will also change the density and the resulting snow water equivalent, or, or SLR. So um, when we're looking at this diagram, the, the, the log P skew T, the y-axis over here, the vertical axis, is in units of millibar of pressure, and uh, it's, a, it's a logarithmic scale um, 
because you can see that these uh, grid lines are, are nonlinear in uh, their step sizes. So that's where the log P part comes from. So this is pressure, this is atmospheric pressure, uh, and it's essentially a proxy for altitude or elevation. So you can see actually these uh, marks here in red which show you uh, the height off of the surface. Uh, so here's the surface level. Uh, and that's the corresponding pressure at the surface level, 1611 meters, uh, where this balloon was sent up. Uh, and then this is increasing. So as you increase altitude, of course, the pressure is dropping, the atmospheric pressure is dropping. So uh, you can just imagine this as really a cross-section of the atmosphere as you're going from the surface uh, uh, upward. So the other relevant axis for us is actually this dashed orange line or this series of dashed orange lines. And these actually correspond to this x-axis labeling, which is temperature in degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's where the skew t uh, part of this plot comes in. Because instead of having uh, nicely oriented uh, grid lines, we have grid lines that are skewed. So the temperature axes are actually skewed uh, and they step this way, so they're running from left to right, they're these dashed lines. Uh, and so you have pressure as you're going up this way, and then you have temperature decreasing uh, sort of in this angular way. There's other lines here that uh, are extremely useful for, for meteorology, but not um, we're not going to cover them in this class. So you have two bold lines that are plotted on the log P skew T. The green line is the dew point temperature. So that's the temperature at which condensation will occur out of the atmosphere. And the red line is the actual measured temperature. So if we're trying to extract the highest temperature that the snowflake would experience as it's precipitating and falling through the atmosphere, then we'll look at the red line here. And remember, the axes are these dotted lines, uh, and those intercept the x-axis down here. So we're, we're right here. That's the hottest point, the highest temperature point in the atmosphere. And that corresponds to maybe minus 8 C. So how is that temperature relevant? Well, we have a couple ways to, to look at this. Uh, remember that the temperature and the relative humidity or the supersaturation uh, is the driving force for the different crystal habits as they form in the atmosphere. This is the, 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 the famous plot that we've looked at in the Snow Science course. And so we can look at this uh, and take our minus 8C from our skew T diagram and we can match it up and we can say, okay, so at minus 8, we're somewhere in this region, so we would expect these types of crystal forms, this column category, to form depending on what the relative humidity or the supersaturation uh, of the system is. Again, this is assuming no wind conditions. This is a, a, a pretty dramatic oversimplification, but it is one mechanism that we can start to interpret snow on the ground as it's freshly fallen compared to uh, what environmental or physical factors it experienced uh, during its formation and on the way down. The other thing we can look at is a plot like this, and there are several out there, but this is one in the slide deck for snowpack assessment, uh, which shows the snow ratio, which is the same as the SLR, the snow liquid ratio, uh, as a function of temperature. So again, we can go to the minus eight uh, line here, and then we can say, what is the equivalent SLR? And that's saying that we should be around 10. And so that allows us to compare our measured density of snowfall. So we can measure that density by just sampling that snow, taking its mass, and then comparing that to what the predicted SLR is. And notice here that the shape of this curve uh, of the SLR as a function of temperature uh, sort of approximates the, the, the shapes of the crystals and their relative densities that we would expect upon snowfall. So you can see that the largest, biggest dendrites, the ones with the highest surface area, are right in the middle of the temperature regime. That's also where we see the highest SLR. Remember, SLR is snow liquid ratio. So that means at an SLR of 25, that means for every one inch of liquid water, we're producing 25 inches 
of solid snow, which means the density is very, very low. This is really light and fluffy snow, which you would expect when you have high surface area crystal habits falling. You would expect the density to be much lower, much higher, I mean, much higher densities, um, more packing when you have low surface area objects, things like these columns and plates over here, which is why SLR tails off on either end of this prediction. And so, what we want to do is um, take our field observations of freshly fallen snow and compare them to what would be predicted by these two plots. Uh, as they're influenced by the highest temperature uh, in the atmosphere. The other bit that we can sort of interpret from uh, one of these log PSQT diagrams, uh, which we won't go into great detail, uh, but, but uh, supersaturation or relative humidity is uh, also a significant component here. The higher the supersaturation, the faster the growth rate, and typically the larger uh, the types of crystals that we can produce. Uh, since the green line is the, the temperature of the dew point, and the red line is the actual temperature in the atmosphere, as these two uh, curves get really close to each other, then the temperature is near the dew point, right? So we're near, we're, we're, we essentially have really moist air. Um, and so the, the distance between these two objects at the highest temperature also sort of gives you a proxy for whether or not this is really moist air, so high supersaturation, or drier air, so lower supersaturation. Uh, and, and that can sort of qualitatively feed into your observations and your predictions.